Good morning. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Sovereign Challenge for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I was here in the States probably about eight, nine years ago and I'd forgotten American hospitality. I was at CVS yesterday and whilst I was about to make the payment, the cashier said, how's your day doing today? And I was quite taken back. You know, I had to think what was going on here and she did think I was a bit odd. Um, but yes, but uh, great to, to be in the States again. So uh, just to let you know, uh, I work at the Cullium Foundation. Uh, it's the world first counter extremism think tank. My, my role there is a, a head of outreach and a senior researcher. And some further background, for those that are unaware, I was um, in my late teens, let's say, uh, I developed a keen interest. We're having some technical difficulties. One second. It happens on the BBC as well, so not to worry. Um, perhaps I speak, on, speak into this. So, um, developed a keen interest when I was 19, wanted to find out about the Islamic faith in more detail, uh, felt that I couldn't sort of get the answers that I was looking for in my local mosque and, and the elders. So I was almost, almost in kind of limbo. On one occasion, I came out the mosque on a Friday prayer, and there was a young man distributing leaflets. And the leaflet said that it was an obligation for all Muslims to vote for the Islamic State, and if, my, uh, if I recall correctly, that voting in, uh, for democracy was a major sin. Now, at that point, I'd never heard the term caliphate or khilafah. So this was quite an intriguing term and an intriguing moment. As I started talking to this individual, I found myself being completely captivated by what he was saying. He was speaking to me in a language that I could understand, that I could relate to. He was reading verses within the Quran and applying them to geopolitics. And what happened was that Islam, which was up until that point was this kind of dry, abstract thing, became alive right in front of me. And months later, engaging with these such individuals, which I then encountered in university, I became sympathetic to their ideas, and then, and then eventually they won me over, and I joined the Islamic organization uh, uh, known as al Mahajirun, which is now a prescribed organization, which is also referred to as ISIS-UK, and has been linked to 70 cases of uh, terrorists that were trying to actually commit some kind of act. So 70 individuals were actually linked to this organization in one manner or form. So what I'd like to do um, today is answer that question that is somewhat plaguing uh, people in the West, academics, politicians, laymen. How is it that someone born and bred in the West, educated, can be transformed into an extremist and into an extremist that is anti-West to the extent that they feel the need to commit some kind of terrorist attack, killing innocent people. What is that transformation? How does that happen? When the Paris attacks happened and a Syrian passport was found next to one of the uh, suicide bombers, there was almost this type of relief, a sigh of relief, because within that discovery of the passport was an explanation that we're all comfortable with, that such acts, such forms of t uh, extremism, terrorism, come from far away. These are foreign elements. But when it transpired that all of the terrorists were homegrown, there was a sense of unease amongst us. So it is this question that is plaguing all of us. How does this happen? Why does this happen? And what I want to do is 
draw upon my own experiences, being a member of uh, Al Mahajroon for eight plus years, I want to draw upon my experiences and explain to you why I think this happens and how we need to counter it. I want to cast our minds back to the horrific day of 9-11. I woke up that morning, switched on the TV, and saw the first tower being hit, completely captivated by those images, like all of us on that day. Then when the second tower was hit, I felt a moment of elation, joy. The chickens had come home to roost. I phoned up one of my co-members uh, of the organization, Al Mahajri. I said, are you watching TV? Are you watching the news now? America has been hit. He said, yes, I'm coming to you now. He drove down. Whilst I was waiting, I called up Omar Bakri Muhammad, who was the head of Al Mahadru. He arrived. My friend arrived. We got into the car. Incidentally, this friend of mine is actually now doing time in the UK prison for terrorism charges. We got into a car. We drove down to uh, a sort of congested high street, and we were jeering and, uh, uh, you know, celebrating that America had been hit. And we would stop strangers on the street and announce almost, almost of a kind of a victory for Islam. And that's what happened on that day. Two years later, two years later, I was at one of my, what we called, dower stalls, proselytizing the extremist uh, narrative in one of these local um, uh, towns. And another member of Al Mahajrun, another senior member, brought over a, a, a poster, a large A0 poster, glorifying the, the 19 hijackers. And it was entitled, The Magnificent 19. When I saw that poster, I felt uncomfortable. A crowd started to emerge. Chaos, almost chaos, was happening at that moment. People were angry, agitated by this poster. There were conversations happening. A lady approached us, and she looked very distraught, almost about to, to cry. And she turned to us and said, my brother was in one of those Twin Towers. My brother actually died on that day. Now this had a resounding effect on me. I looked to the senior member to look at his, at his face to see some kind of remorse, and there was nothing, almost a smirk. And from that day on, I said I could not continue. And incidentally, not short after that, I left the organization. So the question is, how did joy and elation of America being hit? Now, remember, at no point did I even question what was happening. At no point did I have any remorse on watching that day of the people that were jumping out of, the, uh, out of those windows to avoid being burnt alive. At no point did I have any kind of sympathy who were innocent people that went to work that day, simply went to work to earn a living. At no point did I have any kind of emotion. Two years later, such an emotion that gave me the motivation to leave the organization. So the question is, how is it that where I have joy in one instance and in the other is disgust and horror. How did that happen? And what I want to do today, if I may, is go through some ideas which I think contributed to that. 
ideas that contributed me, someone who was a normal young man who became an extremist and then incidentally found the way of getting out of, the, of that mindset and that organization. And I, I believe that there are two points that are essential in understanding the extremist mindset. The first is the uh, binary world view. And the second is the uh, suspension of the ethical. So I want, today I want to cover these two points in order that we can understand what is happening here. Now, uh, extremism, wherever it occurs, is comprised of distinct characteristics, one of which is this type of dualistic thinking. And, and this is a type of splitting of the world in binary terms into good and evil. And in terms of Islamic ex extremism, what we have is Islam on one side, all that is good, all that is moral, all that is right, all that is just on one side, and on the other is we have everything other than Islam. So uh, we have kufr, which means disbelief on one side. We have immorality on the other. Uh, we have what is, what is completely wrong. This is... And if you're going to take something away from this uh, presentation, I ask you to take away this. Any type of extremist reading, literature, any type of extremist type of uh, comprehension of the world, or any rhetoric, operates within this framework. And we'll discover uh, how this kind of plays out in, in the kind of rhetoric that, that, that they put out there. And the effects of such dualistic thinking causes one to see others in, a ver in very partial terms, almost as objects, such that extremists lose the ability to imagine the humanity of uh, others. So by defining those who are not in the group as evil, extremist mindsets reduce and can eliminate, very importantly, empathy for the other and ultimately dehumanizing the outer group. This also affects the social level as well. People that do not subscribe to Islam with this framework in mind are seen as, as immoral. And all experiences with non-Muslims are filtered through this binary lens. So an extremist, the way an extremist lives their life is completely through this kind of binary lens. Any type of interaction with non-Muslims, any kind of uh, sense of living within society has this operating in the background. So non-Muslims are, are essentialized as being immoral. In essence, non-Muslims are seen as hateful caricatures of subhumanity. Eradicating so, so seeing the world in these kind of stark binary outlooks eradicates the middle ground. And the problem with that is that it does away with the importance of uh, coexistence, pe peaceful coexistence, for example, tolerance, mutual respect, which are essential for, for citizens of different backgrounds, different re religions to, to, to live peacefully. Now, this also has, this type of binary outlook is also very much so uh, affects the, uh, the political outlook of, of the world. And we have terms like Darul Islam, God's law on one side, and we have Darul Kufr, or land of the infidels, and on that side, we have man-made law. And these are very, when you read Islamic literature, you will uh, be presented with these, these definitions, if you like. These are, uh, 
and we will look into this perhaps later on, these are constructs of how to view the political world uh, at large. Sometimes Western uh, societies are described with the pejorative word jahiliya. Uh, this term is com uh, commonly translated as the age of ignorance. In classical Islam, the term denotes a pre-Islamic situation of Arabia ca categorized by the pa pagan ignorance of God's word. But what we have here in the way that it's used is very, very different. Now, Said Qutb, you can see here, was um, leading member of the Egyptian Muslim uh, Brotherhood in the 1950s and, and, was, uh, f and was the first to take this classical concept and to apply it to the, uh, to the, modern, to the modern world, this term of jahiliya. Uh, and today's Islamist extremist uh, Islamist circles revere Qutb as an exemplary individual who sacrificed his life for the truth of God's so sovereignty. Qutb argued that there are two t only, only two types of uh, societies. Again, uh, very much operating in this binary way. The Islamic and the Jahili. To him, Jahiliya was not just a fixed moment in history, but a moral condition which reoccurs whenever society deviates from its utopian Islamic ideal. Thus, he deemed all the contemporary world as Jahili, as they subverted the will of God and had adopted man-made laws to regulate their affairs, which was the source of moral decay. And... Today, as he says in a quote, he says, today, today, too, we are surrounded by jahiliya. Its nature is the, the same as during the first period of Islam, and it, and it is perhaps more deeply entrenched. Our whole environment, people's beliefs and ideas, habits and art, rules and laws, is jahiliya. And that's an extract from the milestones. Today's... Uh, Islamists echo the very same rhetoric, uh, similar in vain, dichotomous and hostile view of the world is rife. Here is um, the uh, banner of Hizb Tahrir. Hizb Tahrir was, uh, was uh, established in 1953 by a Palestinian uh, who is a judge, if I'm not mistaken, by the name of uh, Takatin Nabani. And uh, Hizb Tahrir is a radical international political organization that describes its ideology as Islam, and it seeks to re-establish the Islamic State. Now, since Hizb Tahrir has, ever since its uh, inception, it has spread to over 50 countries and has grown to a membership estimated between uh, tens and thousands to uh, estimated to up to a million. And it has a very active presence within the West. My organization that I was part of, Al Mahajroon, was actually a splinter organization of Hizb Tahrir. Now, the, the very same kind of reasoning and the very same type of outlook of the world is, is, per, has permeated the Islamist Hizb Tahrir uh, reading. Um, hands aware of Hizb Tahrir's existence in your own background, your own country. Any hands? Okay, just one. And I take it that you're from around the world here? Right. Well, that's worrying that you don't know about this organization because I can think of many countries that they're in causing havoc at the grassroots level. And this is part of the, the work that we do at the Kulian Foundation is sometimes we're kind of taken aback by how little people know about these organizations. And, it, and I don't want to put this lightly. What these organizations do is provide the intellectual framework that gives gravity to, the, uh, to organizations like ISIS. Now, Hizb Tahrir will condemn ISIS. They will say they're an abhorrent organization. They don't represent Islam. However, however, they hold on to the same theological principles that give rise to ISIS. Uh, to give you an example, there is a uh, 
someone by the name of uh, Haytham al-Haddad, referred to as Sheikh Haytham al-Haddad by, by his followers. I won't be using that term. Uh, he is considered uh, a hate preacher by some. Uh, comes from a very sort of Salafist, Wahhabist, trained in Wahhabi, Wahhabism uh, teaching. And he uh, put out a video very recently condemning ISIS, attacking ISIS, uh, for killing apostates. The video was about an hour long. The conclusion of his video was ISIS were barbaric and wrong because they were killing apostates in the wrong way. So my point here is that these individuals, these extremists, they are bound by certain outlooks and, and theology that give rise and gravitas to these organizations. So please be aware of these organizations. Uh, they are causing immense amounts of havoc in, in, in the West. To give you an example, in 1996, Hizb Tahrir declared an intellectual, moral, political battlefield uh, between their Islamist ideology and the West. They say, dear Muslims, you must wake up and realize the reality behind what the infidels and their followers are plotting. You are today called upon to defend your creed, your ideology. It is time to distinguish the truth from falsehood as clear and distinct as life is from death. On one side, the side of falsehood, are America, the infidel West, and your rulers and their supporters, allured by, the cap by capitalism and seduced by its way of life. Today, today all to together with those who call for democracy, pluralism, human rights, free market policy. And on the other side, the side of truth, are those carriers of the Islamic core. From among the Muslim people, who adhere to their ideology. It is indeed a decisive battle in which their destiny is determined. There is no room for neutrality in this decisive battle with friends like those who need enemies. Um, here's another quote. In another publication, they write, thus it is truly considered a violent intellectual struggle. This clash is so clear that it requires no evidence. For we are living in a, in a uh, daily, no matter how much some intellectuals and the capitalists are influencing them uh, attempt to hide it. Uh, this is in a publication entitled The Inner... Uh, in Sorry, I can't have the text here. Yeah. Anyway, the clash of civilization. Sorry, misprint in here. Uh, the West is seen as a decadent society, devoid of any morality, and is the, uh, the root of all ailments in the world. So part of this type of, what we have to understand is that this type of outlook, this binary outlook, is an ethical outlook. And that's, that's really extremely important. So... What I want to show you here is an, an extract from a, uh, uh, an article that was published in, in, in a newspaper, uh, in an online uh, newspaper. Now, just to give you some background, for those that aren't aware, there was a scandal in, in, America, uh, in, in the UK regarding the Asian community up north. There, were, there was a, a, a gang of Asians in uh, Rochdale that were uh, convicted of grooming white girls, underage girls. And this ca uh, caused a, 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 a tremendous stir within the media and opened up many, many debates. People were attacking uh, Asian culture, people were attacking Islam, they were saying perhaps Islam is to blame for such acts and so forth. So these kind of uh, there were a tremendous amount of discussions back and forth happening. And Hizb Tahrir released a, a statement or an article, if you like, and they, and they say this. They say, the widely publicized Rochdale grooming case is involving nine Pakistani men uh, tapped into a, an undercurrent of racism and anti-Muslim feeling with the media and the politicians quick to blame culture, religion, for why Asian men targeted young white girls. So what they're saying is that this is unfair. You're not taking the incidents for, for their own sake. 
in and of themselves, but what you're doing is that you're generalizing the particular to the general of Asian people and Asian culture, namely the Islamic faith. So they're being critical. They're saying, look, this is not a fair representation. But look what they, they then do in the following paragraph. Looking beyond the Western-centric world, there is an alternative set of values which considers accountability of man to a creator. Islam offers this creed which is both political and spiritual in nature, an attitude which is rooted in a rejection of notions such as personal freedom, helps to create an environment in an Islamic society, whether people are Muslim uh, or otherwise, which sees freedom as counterproductive to society at large. So they're a victim of their own criticism. What they're saying is that you're taking these examples of these Muslim Asian uh, gangsters, if you like, and you're saying that this is linked to Islamic culture or Asian culture. But in return, they are doing exactly the same thing. What they're doing is that they, they're uh, looking at incidents of, let's say, um, for, for those that aren't aware, there was a scandal, uh, which is the uh, phone tapping scandal, where the news of the world, were f uh, their journalists were found to tap the, the telephone conversations of some of the people they were trying to, to uh, expose. This was a major scandal, which led to the news of the world actually shutting down. And what Hezbo Tahrir do in these incidences, they say, aha, this is liberalism, this is democracy, this is your culture, your Western culture that leads you to, this, to these kind of acts. Another incident was the Jimmy Savile case that was a, was a major paedophile scandal. Jimmy Savile was a, a famous presenter in the UK who, uh, after his death, it, 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 many, many, hundreds and hundreds of victims came out and, and basically said that they were sexually abused by this man. And this was a, a man that was a pretty much a hero during the 1960s, uh, sorry, 70s and the 80s. I, I for one, uh, you know, was, as a child, used to watch him, and he was, he was a pretty much the, the, an untouchable celebrity. And it transpired that there was almost kind of institutionalized acceptance of what he was doing and, and the conversation continues. And what the likes of Hizb Tahrir do is they, they take those incidences because of that binary outlook and they essentialize uh, non-Muslims with such acts. So the reason pedophilia happens is not because that individual was necessarily bad. It happens because we have a culture that, that enables it to happen namely Western culture, namely uh, non-Islam, namely man-made law. So, so you can imagine, as a, as a young man, you are looking at the world, you are seeing every form of corruption linked to Western culture. You identify yourself as a Muslim, you cannot relate to the world at large. You cannot now, what happens is you cannot, re you cannot relate to the society that you were born and bred in, to the West. Because the West is an embodiment of, embodiment of evil, of all that is decadent, that is immoral in the world. What does that do to the psyche of the individual? It creates alienation. Suddenly what happens is that you start feeling that... Um, that you're no longer at home, almost like a fish out of water. So this sense of alienation is created through the indoctrination of Islamist extremist propaganda. Then what happens, then what happens is then there is a yearning for something else. You start to yearn a society that reflects your disposition. And what is that? That is the utopian Islamic state. This is how it all begins. And it is important that, that we make that, uh, that distinction between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. It's very important because one of the problems that I, 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 I seem to watch on sort of news channels, academics, for example, what they try to do is 
they try to take the logic of Al-Qaeda and apply it to ISIS. And that's why they get things wrong. What people have to understand is that jihadism evolves. It's not stagnant. Whereas uh, uh, Al-Qaeda's message was about the far enemy, it was about ridding foreign forces on, on Muslim land, ISIS is a lot more. Is that and also a lot more. ISIS is not just about fighting the far enemy. It is not just about uh, fighting people that occupy their land. It is the opportunity to live a genuine Islamic life. It is an opportunity to live within the Islamic State, or what they consider to be the Islamic State. And this very idea of the Islamic State is premised upon a rejection of the West, a rejection of the West. In a sense, it's a very rejectionist type of uh, ideology. It is, it's underpinned by Wahhabism, which incidentally is a rejectionist ideology itself. So it's very important that we, un that we understand that jihadism has evolved and the attraction to ISIS is no longer purely about ridding foreign, foreign fighters. It is about the opportunity to live within the Islamic State. That is why that we have stories of families uprooting themselves and traveling to Syria. That didn't happen in the time of uh, bin Laden. That didn't happen at the time of Al-Qaeda. That's happening now. Because the whole message of jihadism is different. The whole message of extremism is, uh, has evolved. Now, so, so now let's come back to imagine being a Muslim living in the West who is being given this indoctrination of what Islam is, uh, how, how the West is, that the West is antithetical to Islam. It is, you, are, you have this type of uh, hostile narrative of the world and that the West is ultimately the embodiment of all that is immoral and all that is wrong in the world. That has a profound effect on you, well, on me, on individuals that were part of, parcel of that indoctrination. Now, I want to show you a video of, to give you some background. There are three people in this video and all of them are uh, members of Al-Mahajirun. Al the uh, chap in the middle is a convert to Islam. And what I want you to do is listen very carefully to his explanation why he converted to Islam. And look at how it is premised on a rejectionist type of worldview. So let's play that now. Oh. Okay. Okay. Got it. Alhamdulillah. I've been Muslim for nine years now. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Um, uh, it's a beautiful na'ma to blessing to be a Muslim. And um, my message for humanity in general is um, say no to democracy and say yes to Islam. At the moment, we're living under uh, man made laws throughout the whole world. And we see what it's doing uh, to the population. You know, people are being oppressed, and um, people are living, you know, really, um, just day by day, just paying the bills. You know, and I work in the construction, and many people there working. We all work six days a week just to pay bills. Subhanallah. And this is not how people should be living. You know, people should be, you know, have time. You know, to really search about their purpose in life. That's why under Islam, you know, food, clothing and shelter will be free for the populace. You know, if you look at the Islamic State today in Sham, you know, people are being provided for, the houses, everything's been provided. You know, that is if, and if you look in, even if you look in the past, where the Muslims had the upper hand, uh, Muslims, uh, Muslims uh, the Khalifa was providing these necessities, these basic necessities for the people. And this is a, the right that Allah has given humankind. You know, even the natural resources will not be exploited under Islam. You know, so our message 
obviously you know look at the system you know look what it's doing um, to the people you know people you, just, you, you can't really drive far in this country the UK without going past a homeless person on the street begging or a homeless person just sleeping on the street you know this is democracy you know democracy um, uh, you know even this recent case recent cases that are going, coming in the news about you know women who have been raped and the police don't do nothing about it. You know, in some cases they stand by and let the and they know about the rape that's going on. You know, this is the situation in this country. You know, even if you look at the MPs, how they and the pedophile rings, you know, they have they're having. You know, this is the people that are ruling your affairs. You know, so this is you know, this is our message. You know, wake up and you know realize that there is a solution. You know, you don't have to keep voting. You don't have to keep you know in this you know if you like matrix. You know, you can. You know, come out of this, you know, uh, madness and, you know, think, you know, why am I here? You know, and the reason why you're here is to worship Allah. So our purpose in life is to worship, follow and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to follow our desires, not to obey a man like David Cameron or Barack Obama's legislation, rather to follow Allah's legislation. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِلَى الْحُكْمُ إِلَى لِلَّهِ That the judgment is only for Allah. So this is the situation, you know, um, return to Allah. That's our, my message in show. So you see he starts to talk about God. Then he talks about how corrupt the, the, the West is. And then he talks about establishing an Islamic state. Now, uh, he spoke about uh, the, again, there's another scandal happening. I'm really being a bad PR person for the UK here, but it's not that bad, seriously. But the, another scandal is a, that's currently in, in the papers uh, is a, a paedophile ring that existed amongst MPs and senior figures uh, during the 1970s. And that's what he's referring to. So he's saying again, he's saying, look, you know, look at these people. It is because of their, their corrupt system. It's their corrupt culture, their immorality. And what he means by that is it's, it's non-Islam. Now, but the question is this. It is the same society that is also exposing those very same people. It is the same society that has a legal system that will imprison those in individuals. Now, for us, that makes, that's obvious. And what he's saying is completely bizarre and absurd. But we're not working with the binary outlook. His complete observation of the world is filtered through those binary worlds, world views. Hence, that's why he sees what he sees. The reason that he omits those other factors, which are vital in making sense of what's happening in the world, because it doesn't fit with his binary outlook, the good and evil, Islam and non-Islam. And for us, we may be thinking that this is completely absurd and he must be mad. That is a mistake. What we have to understand is that individuals like this, individuals that commit acts of terror, that blow themselves up, they are not insane people. They are perfectly rational. And that is something that we must understand and appreciate. These people are working within a framework which justifies their actions. The, the challenge for us is to understand that it is rational, because if we don't, then we will never be able to defeat it or limit its grasp on young minds. So we see there an example of what that kind of indoctrination does to an individual. Now, when I look at that and I hear that, I have two emotions. One is of humor. I find it funny. But the other one is regret, because I used to say the same things when I was a young man. And, it's perf and you know, what we have to understand is that these people go to university. These are educated. Um, maybe not the one on the left, who his videos are quite out there. But um, th I mean, what we have to understand is that these are sane, functioning, normal functioning people, and that their actions, according to their worldview, is very, very much rational. So that's very important to, to understand. So what, so the, and what's interesting is this kind of binary outlook is in, is in the, uh, 
was a statement released by uh, ISIS, interestingly. And it says, and this was, this was entitled, Eliminating the Grey Zone. And look what it says. The Muslims in the West will quickly find themselves between one or two choices. They either apostatize and adopt the Kufr infidel religion propagated by Bush, Obama, Blair, Cameron, Sarkozy, uh, Holland, in the name of Islam, so as to live amongst the Kufar, the infidels, without hardship. Or they will perform hijra, emigrate to the Islamic State, and th thereby uh, escape persecution from the Crusader government and citizens. And that was uh, 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 an article in the Dabak magazine. So again, ISIS is, ve is uh, again, we see that type of binary outlook within ISIS's literature, which is not surprising. So with all those kind of factors in play, what we have to understand is that like any type of extremism, Islamic extremism is no different in the sense that it has this characteristic. If we look at uh, sort of uh, neo-Nazis, for example, they also have this type of uh, outlook of the world. And what is important is that when you have a binary outlook, when you eradicate the middle ground, when you uh, essentialize non-Muslims, then it becomes possible to rationalize committing violence against them. Because when, when you're at that level, you're, you have dehumanized those individuals. And you have lack of empathy whatsoever. And there's a, I've got a video, um, a video clip from the uh, film American History X. Um, this is played by, uh, anyone seen this film? Great, excellent. Um, Edward Norton plays uh, a, a young man uh, called Danny Vineyard, and um, he uh, becomes attracted to uh, a neo-Nazi organization, white supremacist organization. And I remember watching this film, and it really resonated with me, because I saw parallels with the way that I used to look at the world. The way that he looks at the world, black and white, the way that he has no sympathy for anyone that is non-white, I had the same kind of sentiments towards non-Muslims, who I saw them as infidels and, and kafir. So I, I've taken this clip, it's a, it, they're at the dinner table, and they're talking about the Rodney King riots. And I've added my sort of commentary on there as well. So you can see the kind of parallels. It's subtle, but it's, it, it, it's there, and I'd like to play that now. The irony is that most of the stores that were destroyed during the riots were owned by black people. That's stupid, though. I mean, why trash your own neighborhood? Well, that's my point. It's an irrational act. It's like an expression of rage by people who feel neglected and turned away by the system. Exactly. I mean, it's like we had in Watts or right. the riots in Chicago in 68. That's crap. I don't buy that for a minute. Calling a riot an irrational expression of rage, that's such a cop-out. It's opportunism at its worst. It's a bunch of people grabbing any excuse they can find to go and loot a store. Nothing more. You know, the fact that these people ripped off the stores in their own communities, all that reflects is the degree to which these people have absolutely no respect for the law at all, and certainly no concept of, like, community or, or civic responsibility. Well, wait a minute. White people commit crimes against white people, too. Yeah, but they're not offing each other in record numbers all over America. Look at the statistics, for Christ's sakes. It's one in every three black males is in some phase of the correctional system. Is that a coincidence, or do these people have, you know, like a racial commitment to crime? <laughs> Not only that, they're proud of it. Well, maybe it says something about prejudice in the judicial system. Yeah, if you want to talk about criminal statistics, you might want to take a look at the social inequalities that produce them. Yap, yap. You know what? That's exactly what I hate. Because what you're doing, Davina, is taking one thing and calling it something else and just, you know, alleviating the responsibility that these people have for their own actions. You know, it's like saying, it's not a riot, it's rage. It's not crime, it's poverty. It's, it's just nonsense. It's bullshit. You know, it's exactly what happened in this trial, too, because the media twisted things around so people got all focused on you know these cops and whether or not they were going to get convicted and whether Rodney King's civil rights had been violated I mean everybody lost sight of old Rodney King himself I mean the guy's a multiple felon by his own admission he's high as a goddamn kite driving 120 miles an hour down the highway he gets pulled over by a bunch of cops and, and, and he attacks them 
He attacked police officers. That's the bottom line. And he walked. Yeah, and there's some Yahoo there with a video camera who turned it on halfway through so that all we see is them hitting him. Exactly. You know, you got your pal and coon winding up and cracking him with billy clubs and Bersenio kicking him in the back of the skull. So it looks severe, you know? And people are going, oh, this poor guy. This poor guy who attacked four cops and those cops end up on the stand defending themselves for using absolutely standard textbook self-defense procedures. I, I don't think that the tape showed that at all. Oh, you didn't think so, huh? And what, you're an authority, Ma? <laughs> Murray, what do you think? Well, I, I did think that the police used their clubs rather excessively. Who are you to say what's excessive? I think it was totally appropriate. I think they're in a better position to make that judgment call than you are. In fact, we as society grant cops a certain amount of authority to make those calls because we acknowledge that, that their job is difficult and dangerous. You know, unfortunately, very few people like respect that. Respect that. What is your point, Derek? All right, think about this. Think about this. If Danny had been walking across the street that night and Rodney King had plowed into Can him. Can we just drop this Rodney King thing? Mm hmm. Who would like some dessert? We're, we're having a discussion. We're having a nice discussion, right? If Rodney King had been driving along, hopped up on Shivas Regal and PCP, and had killed Danny, you'd be singing a very different tune about the force of anybody cut. in the tapes, and neither did you. He didn't happen to kill anybody, thank God. Put it down, okay? Allie's sleeping. If he had, though, I mean, come on, think about it. If that fucking monkey had run some kid over, everybody would have a very different opinion of this whole matter. You know, they'd be focused on, on Rodney King and not on these officers, but instead, he just attacked a few cops. And so and all of a sudden, it's hands across America for this fucking total son of a bitch. I mean, it blows my mind. We're so hung up on this notion that we have some obligation to help this struggling black man, you know, cut him some slack until he can overcome these historical injustices. It's crap. This stuff you guys are saying just perpetuates it. All this liberal nonsense, you know, everyone's turning and looking the other way while our country rots from the inside out. I mean, Christ, Lincoln freed the slaves. What, like... 130 years ago. How long does it take to get your act together? Yeah, so uh, we can see the kind of subtle uh, similarities and the, the type of narrative that's out there. So for this sort of understanding is that having a binary outlook is, is pretty much uh, axiomatic to the, it, it, the extremist Islamist type of reading. And what that does, that creates a kind of hostile outlook of the world, which perpetuate, perpetuates this kind of us against them kind of narrative. And what that does psychologically, it means that that individual is almost has or does have a kind of siege mentality. And with that siege mentality, Muslims are never, never, uh, or Muslim communities should never be criticized. All the fault is, is with the West. Uh, and there is this perpetual battle of cultural value battle with the other, namely uh, anything that's non-Islamic. Non so let me now move to the second point, which is what I call the suspension of the ethical. Does anyone know who that is? No? Okay. That I can make it up and get away with it. Um, no. Uh, so this is um, Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, no, he's not an Islamic uh, terrorist, don't worry. Um, from the uh, 19th century, a, he's considered one of the most important Christian writers. He's known for criticizing the dulling down of religion, uh, uh, religion's uh, essential aspect of sort of subjectivity. He, uh, his, his critiques were, were often expressed in form of like polemical outbursts against a uh, succession of intellectuals. And Soren Kierkegaard believed that, that genuine faith was premised on passion, uh, passionate subjectivity, and that objectivity of science, uh, scientific thinking was, uh, was eclipsing uh, the religious uh, belief. And Kierkegaard uh, argues that the actions of Abraham are not ethical, and uh, his, his faith does not fit within sort of a rational system. Let me, let me just sort of open that up a bit. There is a link here, by the way. It's not a random uh, point here. Soren Kierkegaard was very much 
uh, a product uh, was seeing religion being dumbed down and it was constantly being attacked by sort of the rationalist thinkers and it was post enlightenment so for him religion was losing its ground christianity had lost its appeal and the the scientific and the rationalistic thinkers were completely ta taking over and he felt that that was destroying the christian faith and he argued that religion and faith do not operate within the rational world or the scientific world, that it operates in a world that supersedes it at a higher realm. And he used the story of Abraham in the Bible. So when God asks Abraham to slaughter his son and Abraham follows through with that thinking, follows through with that action, what Soren Kierkegaard says here is that that was a purely anti-rationalistic decision. It was purely based on faith. We can't understand that. It does not work within our natural uh, modern sensibilities. So what he says is religious faith, God, the commands of God are with the suspension of the ethical. How is this linked to what I'm saying? Well, this type of sentiment that religion operates outside of reason and rationality, outside of ethics, has now completely hijacked the Islamic intellectual discourse. Currently now, in terms of the US, the Muslim communities within the West they're not suffering with this as much as the, the British Islam, if you like. We are completely uh, under siege with this type of thinking. That Islam is somehow nothing to do with reason. Islam has nothing to do with ethics. It operates in its own field. And currently now, there is a tension between two camps. We have the rationalistic Muslims, which I would consider myself of that camp and the uh, anti-rationalistic Muslims. And on that side, no surprise, we will have the kind of Wahhabist, kind of uh, puritanical type of reading of Islam. And these individuals, unfortunately, have completely hijacked the, uh, the, the voices of the Muslim community within the UK. And you will see this, uh, if you look at the social media, if you look at debates, any discussions, any articles, that there is this constant tussle between the two. I was on a, uh, a BBC program in uh, February called The Big Questions, and it was um, uh, entitled British Islam. And that is a brilliant example of what I'm talking about here. And I do ask you, please, if you have some time to actually watch that. It's very entertaining, as one of my uh, friends here said it was. Um, and and what, why, is, why is this a concern? So now remember this, you've got that binary outlook, you completely dehumanize non-Muslims, non you have a hostile outlook, then it comes to, well, what do we do? If you do not operate within an ethical sphere, if you operate within what's this called, this kind of arbitrary kind of area, anything goes, anything goes. Dostoevsky said, without God, everything goes. Torture is fine. Killing innocent people is fine. Everything goes. There's no God. All that's fine. I would add, if you believe in God, and you believe that God mandates irrationality, God does not operate within ethics, everything also goes as well. And there, are, and there are many examples of this, how what I'd consider to be puritanical Muslims who, who uphold things are morally, ethically uh, indef indefensible and yet feel that they're somehow serving God. For example, apostasy killing. The idea that you can kill someone for changing their mind. The idea that you can kill someone for, for having the choice to follow a religion of their choice. So a Muslim wants to leave Islam and follow any other religion, whatever it may be. 
the default position, the classical understanding, the majority position, is that that person should be killed. What we have now is individuals that are mainstream Muslims. They're not ISIS supporters. They don't support terrorism. They don't support any of these acts. But they will support these noxious views. That is, the biggest, that is the biggest challenge that we have now. We have within the Muslim community or communities around the world, in varying degrees, a theological crisis. That is what's happening now. So couple that with the kind of uh, world view. Couple that with a theological crisis that, that is antithetical to ethics. It's a dangerous cocktail. Dangerous cocktail. Here's an example of, I, by the way, I often get a lot of hate uh, on a daily basis. And um, here's an example uh, of the kind of things that uh, I get on a daily basis. I'm uh, not liked very much in the UK, by the way. Um, but so what you can see there, that reading halfway down, that it doesn't make sense. But it says, unfortunately, you haven't uh, had that then Islam will never make sense to you, your metaphysics view of the world. You can never rationally understand or comprehend God's commands of the lawgiver who, who is outside of the realm and he is not bounded by t time, etc., etc. So you get the sentiments there that this is a type of Islam that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Um, I've been uh, told that I need to wrap up and uh, what I will do now is I'll end here and hopefully answer some of your questions. Thank you for listening. Uh, sir, uh, thank you very, very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you two questions, please. First of all, are you a Muslim? You want me to answer now? Yeah. Oh, yes, I am. You are yes. a Muslim. Yeah. And I often get can, asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> can you please, uh, just one very simple question. Uh, define what it means to be a kafir and what is the meaning of kafir? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, kafir comes from the, uh, the root word kafara, which means to conceal. So in the classical understanding, uh, a kafir is someone that knows Islam to be true, but does not accept it. And the way in which the extremists use this, this term as anyone that is non-Muslim. And this is a modern type of interpretation of, of this word. And what you will find is that these individuals that are extremists, they, they have the veneer of being ground in orthodoxy, but it's quite the contrary. But again, and I remember, and it's a very good point, I remember when, you know, this is quite embarrassing to say this, but when I was in part of the Islamic organization, Al Mahadrun, and I was with one of my me the, the mentors, if you like, we got onto the tube, the train, the metro, and as we walked in there, he said, he sniffed and he said, it smells of dirty kafir. And at the time, at the time, I, it didn't bother me. It just did not bother me. You know, I thought it was kind of funny at the time. But that is the type of indoctrination that you have. And I was someone that was born and bred in this country, or the UK, and lived with, you know, in, in I had non-Muslim friends, and suddenly I had this kind of peculiar view of them. But, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, you. You devoted the bulk of your presentation to Hezbo Tahrir. Yes. Um, Hezbo Tahrir is um, banned in all but three Arab countries. It's banned in Turkey, it's banned in Egypt, um, and it was established in 1953 after, I mean, um, a couple of decades after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. and they wanted to restore something like that. Yeah. Um, 
but in, and just so you know, they, they've called me a spy, a traitor, just because they saw a picture of me speaking at a, uh, a think tank. Yes. So in, in the Muslim world, I lived there for 30 years, they're a laughing stock. Yes. No one takes them seriously. And yeah. they do not have a large following. Mm. They're actually more active in Western countries Correct. than they are in Muslim countries because they're banned in most Muslim yeah. uh, uh, countries. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the, Muhajir, the, the mm -hmm. organization that you talked about. How big is their following? Um, uh, the uh, and I'm sorry, one last thing I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, as much as I hate the Hizb al-Tahrir for their ridiculous platform, uh, they, according to what they say, according to what they profess, they espouse nonviolence. They, um, yes. they, they say that they would like to pursue this uh, vision through nonviolent means. Yes. Um, and that's an important point. Uh, I do not in any shape or form want to misrepresent the organization. I would consider them a non-violent e extremist organization. However, that doesn't get them off the hook because um, one has to understand, and I'll give you, an, uh, uh, I'll answer your second question, uh, your point. I was part of the organization uh, and back, back then when uh, the Afghan war started, the invasion started. Majority of my friends actually traveled to Afghanistan. Even though Mahajroon was a non-violent extremist organization, see back then when I was part of the organization, back 15, 20 years ago, um, it's not what it is now. Again, the organization has evolved. It's become more jihadist. But back then it was only about establishing the Islamic State but even though we were about establishing the Islamic State, we felt that it was an obligation to go and fight in Afghanistan. And the question is, why? You know, you know these videos that we see of ISIS, you know, of these Westerners with balaclavas and talking to the cameras and making statements? This is all Groundhog Day for me because my friends were doing that back then. They were on the, on the BBC, they were on, on saying, oh Muslims, come to uh, Afghanistan, Mullah Omar is our Amir Mu'mineen, come and fight. This is all Groundhog Day for me. So, and what you have to understand, it's the, the theological noxious principles, they lend themselves to becoming violent. The way to stop this is not just talking to people when they become violent. The way to stop this, or damage limitation if you like, is to stop people going on that journey to begin with. And why my story is important, or what we can learn from it in a humble way, is that when I was growing up, when I was having these ideas thrown at me and, and becoming seduced by them if you like, there was no counter-narrative. There was no counter-narrative. And, that, and the reason that they are laughing stock in, 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 the, in Muslim countries is because there is a counter-narrative. And I think that's a, an important point. Because I remember when I went, because uh, eth uh, ethnicity-wise, I'm Turkish, I, you know, and my family uh, come from a very Sufi tradition. And incidentally, I, I kind of rejected it. And when I went back home, and I, sp and I was so proud to talk to them, and. Uh, about Hizb al-Tahrir because I was a, a contact at the time, they just looked at me and said, come on. You know, they had this kind of condescending tone that, you know, this is, this is silly. This is, you know, just, this is just extremist garbage. And unfortunately, I didn't have much of an in, uh, uh, interaction with them, so I carried on my journey. So my point is that we need to stop people going on that journey to begin with. It's no point dealing with people at the cusp of extremism. It's no point just dealing with them when they're about to, to plant a bomb and arrest them. There needs to be a better strategy in all of the Western countries uh, to stop this growing. And the answer to your question, you know, how big or how many individuals in this organization, very small, very small. The problem at large, and I hope I can make this clear, it's not bound to an organization. It's bigger than that. It's not about the organization. I, I was in Brussels uh, th three weeks ago, two weeks before the uh, Brussels uh, bombings, and I was warning them the danger of extremism. Two weeks later, a bomb goes off. A few bo bombs go off. I have some friends on the ground, and 
he, he gave me some interesting information. He said in 2010, uh, an organization called uh, Sharia for Belgium was, was established, and they were inspired by my former organization. A, a few years later, the leader of that organization was locked up. And I said to him when I, was in, uh, when I was talking to him on the phone, I said, didn't that solve the problem? He said, no, Adam. No, the damage is done. It's like a virus. The, the information was disseminated. So the problem is not about an organization. The problem is the culture and the ideas that are put out there. It is this type of reading of the world that I've spoken about and the theology that underpins it. Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Philippe de Montenoy. I'm a French officer. Um, you touched on the uh, current uh, ideological dispute within Islam, and that reminds me of one of the issues that we have when we try to look at um, Islam in our countries. Uh, we, we hear Muslims saying Islam is A and B, and other Muslims would say, Islam, no, no, Islam is C and D. And there is no referee, official referee in country to say that um, uh, what, what Islam is, is about. So, um, um, as, a, as a European, for, for, the, for the time being, um, what, what do you think would, would, would be good practices to try, to try and organize the Muslim community in our Western countries and make sure that we can start a dialogue with people who are representative of Islam? Mm. Mm. Uh, yes, there, there is no type of body that represents Islam, that speaks officially for Islam. This is a you know, it's, it's almost like a double-edged sword, right? Uh, in the Sunni world, this is, this is a kind of the challenges that we have. The way in which to, um, and just to, to, to kind of explain, the dominant voices are minority. The, the extremist dominant, let's say puritanical, let's say Islamist, let's say Wahhabist, they are the minority within the Muslim communities. However, they have the loudest voices. And they dominate the intellectual discourse. This is, this is an important point to make. Most Muslims do not think like this. Most Muslims, are, you know, the, the stuff that we're talking about today, for example, apostasy killing, they abhor such kind of acts. The problem is that those people in the middle ground, if they have no strong, cogent counter-narratives, they will sway to the right. And the battle is with the middle ground. Unfortunately, those on, those on the right that have gone to this kind of extremist way, it's very difficult to bring them back because they've kind of gone that way. What we need to do is first recognize that these people are a minority. We need to identify them. Identification is very important because these extremists, they hide amongst normal sort of mainstream, civilized, kind of uh, tolerant Muslims. So we need to identify them and then isolate them, cut them out of the community and say that these people are at fault. But that, um, that strategy will only work if the Muslim communities themselves do that. Because if it comes from the outside, if it comes from non-Muslims, it will be seen as a threat. So it's a challenge. So we need to empower, we need to empower the voices that we do have and support them and for them to provide that strong counter-narrative. So we need to, uh, to uh, identify these elements, isolate them from the community, and then provide a strong counter-narrative. That is the, the strategy uh, in short. Thank you.